All right, I just couldn't wait for the parts to come in. We actually got one part in today, but the new correct uh, distributor cap is still not here. It should be here by Friday or Saturday, and it's only Tuesday. I probably won't put this out for another month, so it doesn't really matter what day it is anyway. But I was out here cleaning up shop, and I got distracted, squirrel, and decided to work on the forklift again and figure out our no spark condition. With all new ignition components, except for the cap and rotor, there still should be a spark uh, on the contact points that we replaced and I wasn't getting that so I decided to go ahead and trace all the wiring and kind of just check everything out make sure it wasn't a internal wiring issue and not a component issue so we're just throwing components at it for no good reason uh, I did test all the components before as previously stated the capacitor condenser appeared to be bad as well as the points were worn. So those two components I know was probably the root cause for my intermittent skip on this thing before it would run great for 30 seconds and then it would just start spitting and sputtering and stumble and fall on its face. As soon as you would put it in gear, it would just die immediately. So I checked all that stuff out to make sure that I didn't have any bigger issues going on. I replaced all those components um, and then looked at the wiring itself and I noticed that it's slightly different on the actual spade connector, the points connection. And maybe I routed it a little backwards, but that's how the wire kind of had to go. The original one fit straight down on it with the rolled portion of the crimped insulator on the inside. And this one had it on the outside. So there was really no other way that I could fit that wire in other than stick a different wire in there. I didn't want to go through all that. So uh, I found that that crimped portion on the insulator was actually just barely touching the distributor housing and what that causes is a ground uh, basically a current to ground situation so we have the lead coming out of the negative side of the coil goes down and around underneath and connects to the outside of this um, little stud that's insulated from the actual distributor housing itself there's two plastic connectors that prevent that from touching anything metal inside the distributor housing and then it goes to the spade connector for the points which is all grounded internally and that actually needs to flow through there that electricity needs to flow from the coil through there so that way it can jump the gap on those points when necessary also the condenser is connected to that same ground terminal on the outside of the distributor housing it's kind of like a surge tank or an expansion tank for electricity if you will from those gaps um, in transmission of electrical current through the spark plug so obviously they're not all firing constantly and shooting a spark constantly so there's pulsing of that electricity and that electricity has to have somewhere to go without damaging components and that's what that condenser or capacitor is for i noticed the spade connector was basically barely touching the distributor housing and not allowing spark to jump across those contact points so i just moved it off the distributor housing and we're gonna see if that worked moment of truth no choke no prime <laughs> when you put the rotor back in the distributor before you put the cap on, in case you were wondering. Now this is still the old cap and the old rotor. We're gonna see how worn out those parts are. Success, she runs pretty much like she did the, the first time I fixed it when I received it. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, I am still gonna replace the distributor cap and put a new rotor in it as well. I typically try to do a tune-up on anything that I get with unknown history and this thing definitely had unknown history. It was bought from an auction by the original owner and then picked up by me some years later and I never did that. I never did a fluid change which is terrible. Always change all the fluids as soon as you get whatever vehicle or piece of machinery in your possession. I never did that. Had I done that I probably wouldn't have the issues that I've been having. So spend a little bit of money and tune it up. With that being said, I'm still waiting on the distributor cap. I'm still waiting on the, the rotor actually just at the mailbox today. Uh, the correct rotor, hopefully. I've already got a new coil, new wires, new plugs, a new voltage regulator in there as well. New points, new condenser or capacitor. Uh, and then we have a new rotor and distributor cap coming. 
I'm going to shorten the length on these wires because they are entirely too long. I'll show you how to do that right now. It's fairly simple. And then I have some other components that I bought about six months ago. If you notice how loud this thing is, it's because when I was trying to diagnose it originally, somehow, I'm not going to name names, me, uh, ended up blowing up the muffler. So we're going to hot rod this thing a little bit. I'm just kidding. We're going to put a new original stock muffler back on it. That way it quietens everything down to a reasonable level, shall we say. And I also have filters because I didn't do that when I first bought it, as previously discussed. I got a new hydraulic filter, new oil filter, uh, smear filters and stuff like that that I've already done in the past. Uh, but some of them are still sitting in boxes because this thing died about the time those parts came in. So I wasn't really concerned about putting a muffler on a non-running forklift. But now that we got it running and are going to continue to fix it up, uh, we're going to see what else this thing needs. And it just needs a few minor details, some of which we're going to fix today, some of which I'm going to put off, which is a bad idea, as previously noted. But sometimes I can get done everything I want to get done, and sometimes uh, i got to kick the can down the road. The other major issue is the hydraulic lines on the, the mast themselves. They're in horrible condition. I'm surprised I haven't blown one, and that's about two to 3,000 PSI going through that. So when it does blow, it's going to drench me in hydraulic fluid, which is not something I want. So I'm going to price out some of those and figure out how much that costs. We do have a hydraulic leak on our adjustable fork width, and that's the reason I love this forklift so much is in every other forklift video that I've seen and every other forklift ownership or forklift that I've messed with in the past, uh, they're manually adjustable forks. And this thing has a hydraulic control lever for that where I can spread and retract the forks at will sitting in the driver's seat, which is, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. Obviously we have the height raise, we have the tilt of the forks, but then I have the spreader that allows me to spread and basically size the forks appropriately for whatever piece of machinery or pallet or anything that I move around the shop, which is immensely useful uh, in ways that you cannot imagine. So I kind of want to keep this thing running and keep it around for as long as possible. Parts are cheap and they're readily available. You just have to figure out what it comes off of. Some of the forklift parts, it's an old enough model that you can get relatively inexpensive. And the engine itself came in a Mazda, like a 1970, 71 car parts uh, Mazda engine this is an old Mazda UA engine not the updated VA engine it's just a little four-cylinder um, I can buy a whole rebuild kit and everything for less than 500 bucks that's new liners pistons bearings seals everything so that just kind of is a testament to how cheap this thing is to maintain I just have to actually maintain it so therein lies the crux of the problem and we're gonna go ahead and get busy on doing some maintaining all right, so right now, these spark plug wires, these are just new NGK spark plug wires. Obviously, they're a little bit too long, and so we're just gonna shorten them. Pretty easy. And then after you get your little connector off, all you do is set your wire length. And I want these about as short as possible. So I'm just gonna let this run long in here, set the cap where I want it, which is about right there. And then I'm gonna cut and strip. So we're gonna cut all the extra wire off. Hmm. That didn't go cleanly. Then I just take regular old wire cutters and I put them on the 12 to 3. That way I don't actually like cut through the wire or anything. And I just cut the sheathing. And you just take your time, work your work a work work your way around. And then you should be left with that little black exposed wire there. And then all you do is fold it over the back. And all I did was spread these open a little bit more so it's easier to fit on the wire itself. And for that, you just bend them open. 
So now we're just going to fold this little wire on the back side around. Now we need to talk about why you may want to shorten your spark plug wires in the first place. And obviously, forklifts are heavy, and any weight savings we can get from that is more capacity we can use to lift things with. So this here is a 3,000 pound capacity forklift, which means it weighs over 6,000 pounds. Typically, the forklift itself weighs twice as much as the capacity that it can lift with. So if we can save like 23 grams of weight in spark plug wires, that translates into 23 additional grams that we can lift with. Okay, that was a uh, pretty, pretty ter terrible joke. Okay, uh, I'll admit that. But aside from the weight savings, which is virtually non-existent on a machine that doesn't really require any weight savings whatsoever because they are so heavy, the other reason is aesthetics. So when you enter a car show, you want everything in wire looms and all your engine bays to look pretty. And that's no different even on a piece of machinery that's going to sit in my shop that nobody ever sees but me and maybe you guys now. So what it boils down to is any extra length of wire that you have is a one additional resistance, which even, you know, on a foot of, of spark plug wires, not that much. Okay, let's be honest. So it's not really creating a super more powerful spark if we shorten the wire. The real benefit comes in chafing and wear over time. So anything that you can remove that has the potential to chafe and ground out or wear through any kind of wiring is the better because these wires will vibrate against each other over time and if they're all looped around and dangling in a messed up spaghetti noodle kind of configuration, the spark plug wire itself is going to find its way to a hard edge corner or piece of metal or they're just going to rub up against each other to where they rub through the insulator themselves and then they're going to start creating havoc when it comes to ignition timing being that one cylinder is grounding out um, and maybe two cylinders are grounding out between each other through the wire. So anytime I get the opportunity to shorten the length of the wire, it's relatively easy and it's cheap insurance. I do so, even on a piece of machinery sitting in my shop. If you enjoy this kind of stuff or are into any automotive, welding, metal fabrication, machining, woodworking, or just general garage workshop type projects, 
please consider subscribing. And if you're gonna do that, go ahead and turn on your bell notifications. That way you get notified just as soon as I get around to posting another video. I appreciate it as always. And until next time, thank you so very much for watching this video.